This is uh, Matt Van Epps is going to talk to us about fluvial river geomorphology and stream restoration. He and Sandy Formica have a property water conservation resource center. And you were both with DEQ before, yep. before that. And actually, I was telling the group yesterday everything I know about fluvial geomorphology was from uh, the report you guys said. Probably, yeah. Anyway, I'll turn it over to Matt. Uh, ask him to come. Your name kept coming up and stuff. Talking about development. Great. Uh, it's nice to be here, y'all. Uh, like Dr. Soren said, my name is Matt Van Epps. Um, I've been with the WCRC for about, uh, we're on our seventh year. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization uh, that's, you know, its main mission is to protect uh, and restore natural resources using a watershed-based approach. Uh, it's something that uh, my partner and I established. Uh, we were both at DEQ and kind of felt uh, we were uh, maybe having to fight politics a little bit too much and not necessarily being able to direct our, our projects the direction that we wanted to go. So we uh, formed this uh, entity, like I said, seven years ago, to try to you know, do some positive things uh, with our natural resources here in Arkansas. Um, just to give you a little bit of background uh, on myself, uh, as Dr. Soren said, I was with DEQ uh, for about eight years um, before we started this nonprofit. My education background is chemical engineering from Virginia Tech, and then I have a uh, master's in environmental that I got here from U of A, uh, finished up in 96. And so after finishing up uh, here at Fayetteville, I started with DEQ. Uh, most of the projects we were doing at DEQ revolved around nutrient management issues. We did a lot of work with uh, swine farmers and trying to manage uh, liquid waste there. and um, Also worked with a lot of dairy farmers. Primarily, we were focused on work that was up in the Buffalo River watershed, so that wasn't a bad uh, field job. But um, you know, eventually, we decided just to move in, in this direction. Uh, I mean, we're still working on other assessment projects, uh, a recent completed project we worked on. I was looking at OHV use or um, ATV use in the National Forest and trying to get an idea of the amount of sediment and nutrients that were coming from that uh, particular recreational use in the, in the National Forest and kind of stacking that up a little bit against other potential sources that are out there as far as you know, stream bank erosion or even sediment from gravel roads in and of themselves. Um, Today I was going to talk about uh, stream stability. You know, really the way I just kind of wanted to frame this just to begin with is kind of looking at, if y'all are looking at low impact development, how do we you know, move forward in terms of uh, developing and expanding economically but having a smaller footprint and, and smaller impact on our uh, natural resources. Uh, this is kind of one subcomponent of that uh, philosophy where uh, instead of maybe the typical approach to dealing with uh, smaller streams in urban areas was to treat them as a stormwater conveyance, just merely something that was going to get the water off the streets and out of the out of the city. Um, maybe we're you know we need to move in a direction where we try to uh, blend that into uh, into our cities as a, an asset as far as uh, a benefit to uh, the overall uh, citizenry of our community. So. You know, before we look at specifically uh, some of the stream restoration project that, that we've worked on and the things that you guys went out and looked at yesterday, just kind of want to give a, just a general introduction to stream stability. And I'm sure many of you all have had some introduction uh, throughout your uh, curriculum here at the university. But you know, just to get everybody on the same page so, that, so as we talk about these projects and then maybe get into a Q&A, we can kind of talk on the same page. But I, I would just you know, be curious to know, you know, if somebody asks you, what is stream stability? What does that mean? You know, I think you, we'd get a bunch of different answers. Um, it, what does it mean that, that the stream banks aren't eroding? Or does it mean that we've got a, a healthy, vibrant fishery? Or uh, does it mean that uh, we're having trees not fall into a stream channel? Well, if you think about uh, a river and river dynamics, really what we're looking at is a machine. Uh, and that machine, uh, it's built to do a couple of things. It's made to move water, it's made to move sediment, and it's also designed or, or should be uh, situated in a way that it maintains its geometry. So uh, the, 
the definition of stream stability that I use is the ability of a stream in the current climate uh, to uh, transport its sediment and its water supply uh, without uh, grading or degrading, and it's maintaining its dimension, its pattern, and its profile. So just as a kind of a quick example, uh, we had some pretty significant flooding uh, akin to the type of flooding we had this past spring uh, in 2004. And so these two uh, images kind of give you a comparison of what, when I look at a stream channel, if I would consider it stable or not. And this obviously is a qualitative analysis. We do a lot of quantitative analysis as far as uh, taking measurements of these streams and, and measuring their physical properties. But, you know, we're looking here uh, at a site on the West Fork of the White River up near Winslow. Uh, this is before we had, you know, the 50, 100-year flood, however you want to characterize it. And then that's, this is that same site after the flood. And you'll notice, uh, you know, in the two pictures, the channel pretty much remains unchanged. Uh, I've got a lot of vegetative scour, you know, if you look at the base of these trees, and you can see a lot of debris kind of rafted up into the, into the trunk of the tree. But you still got this bench over here, and you got that bench over here. You don't have trees falling into the water. Um, you know, all these trees that were here before are still there after the flood. So just on a qualitative basis, we would look at that and, uh, you know, consider that to be a stable uh, section of stream. Uh, you know, one of the things I get all the time uh, working with landowners and, and folks who are, you know, trying to make decisions about how to manage, you know, watershed issues and, and looking at streams, everybody's like, well, well, not everybody. There's a, quite a, there's a, a vocal uh, section of the group that says, Streams are always moving. That's just what they do. You know, they're going to migrate across the valley floor. And uh, part of that is true. They are going to migrate across the valley floor. But we're talking about geologic time scale of moving from one side of the valley to the other side of the valley. I mean, we were talking a thousand years, two thousand years. It takes a while for a stable stream to actually move. But it, there is some natural erosion process that takes place on a on a, a natural stream. But you know, one of the things I've been you know I try to capture uh, some video that kind of illustrates. Um, you know, this is just like a 20-second clip of, you know, a stream bank on the White River. And, you know, you're just watching, you know, chunks of earth falling off this bank in a 20-second in a clip. So you can imagine what happens over, you know, the flood duration. And, in fact, on this particular stream bank or river bank, uh, you know, the bank eroded 30-foot laterally during this past spring. So you start quantifying, you know, how much sediment is coming from this stream bank. Then you can start relating that back to costs and, and the expenses of, of restoring something like this versus allowing it to continue in this direction and having the negative impacts that it has on uh, water quality. Uh, this is another site uh, on the White River, uh, West Fork of the White River. Uh, and this just kind of gives you an example. The guys in the, in the photo, uh, the previous year they were standing at the toe of the bank. That's where our toe pin was at. And then one year later, we come back out, and you can see, you know, the amount of erosion that took place just during that, that one-year period. Uh, you know, erosion is going to be variable depending on what type of flow events happen during your monitoring period. Uh, this was kind of an average year as far as the hydrology went. Um, if you looked at the same site during that 2004 flood, there were points along this bank that it laterally eroded 200 feet. So. You know, uh, part of the evaluation process is to make sure you've got a good understanding of what kind of data you're presenting. You know, if, if we were to use that 200-foot uh, lateral erosion rate, we would be overestimating what kind of sediment contribution this site would be making. But, um, you know, looking at this one, it had a, a fairly average hydrologic year. And so for this site, we would say it was about a 20-foot per year average on that particular stream bank. So um, I, I'm sure that you all have considered this and, and have seen some of this before, but, you know, why does it matter if these streams are unstable and falling apart? You know, there's a number of reasons, and, and which one is a higher priority probably depends on your own personal perspective. Um, if you're a landowner, uh, like the, in that previous photo where it eroded 200 feet, that guy's losing uh, cattle land. He's losing acres where he can feed cattle, so he's reducing his potential income. Um, if, if you're Beaver Water District, that erosion is cr uh, contributing sediment and nutrients into Beaver Lake. And that's increasing their uh, water treatment costs. So, you know, Beaver, uh, um, <laughs> uh, Beaver Watershed um, would be concerned about, you know, water quality impacts. Uh, if you're a, a fisherman, if you like to get out and do some wade fishing, catch some smallies, you know, uh, all this sediment dumping into the creek channel, 
what it's going to end up doing is causing uh, your gravels to get filled in with fine sediments. You're going to have fewer macroinvertebrates that are going to be able to take up housing in those riffles, and that's going to diminish the uh, fish population because there's less forage for them. Uh, increased flooding, uh, anytime you have a really unstable stream channel and there's the potential for trees to come off of the stream bank because of that erosion, you get debris blockages, you get higher uh, flooding levels. Lowering of water table kind of ties back into the original uh, landowner concern. And if you have the stream channel and it's lowering its base elevation all the time, you're uh, increasing the potentiometric head, so you're decreasing the water table that's uh, available to, to keep the, the grass on top of this terrace irrigated. So you're going to lose uh, that much more hay and maybe not going to get that second cutting, something like that. Uh, if you, you know, just like to float and, and have an enjoyable float down the river, you know, if you're floating by this all the time, it's just kind of taking away and diminishing that, you know, experience. So it just doesn't look bad. It's got, you know, it, it affects the aesthetics, definitely. So we talked about the definition of stability. Uh, you know, any one change in that definition, we talked about moving water, we talked about moving sediment, talked about the dimensions. Uh, if you change any one of those, then you have the potential to introduce instability into your stream channel. Uh, just looking at a, a river in cross section, uh, just a real a basic view. You know, we're looking at the, the stream channel down at the bottom with the flood plain, and then you'll have your terraces out here. And most of the streams that uh, I've shown here uh, today have incised to the point where they no longer have immediate access to a flood plain. They actually have to get up to their terrace before they're able to spread out and reduce near bank shear stress. And, uh, shear stress is one of the things that we look at in, in terms of evaluating uh, stream stability. The higher the near bank shear stress, the more erosive forces are placed against that eroding stream bank. So the higher the force, uh, more erosion takes place. So looking at uh, one of the dimensions of the stream channel, if we look at the cross section of the stream, if we're standing out in the middle of the stream and looking downstream and looking at what the shape of that channel was, uh, any change that might be uh, might take place in that stream channel has potential to cause uh, channel instability. And this actually uh, is two photos from that sweet briar site that you guys looked at yesterday. But, um, and we'll talk more about that site, uh, and I'll show you some before and after pictures. Uh, but the original concept uh, at that, that park was to put in a check dam that created backwater to uh, submerge a water line that went across there, a 36-inch high-pressure line. And it works fairly well for a few years, but you can see this deposition that's taking place up here. Uh, after subsequent storms and more and more storms, this bar began to build up more and more and continue to push the stream bank this way. So right here you can see this is the edge of that check dam that originally was probably keyed into the bank 10, 15 feet. Uh, and you can see now, you know, before we did any of that restoration work, you know, what that stream bank was looking like. Um, but this is one of those changes that can induce instability. You start putting cross-channel obstructions in a creek, it's not going to be able to efficiently transport that sediment. You get deposition, then the water starts trying to work around that deposition, and you end up with a situation like this. Uh, so, you know, that can happen with low water crossings. If you get a, a low water ford, if, you, if you're out, you know, in the county on a gravel road and you go across a gravel slab or a concrete slab and you look upstream and you look downstream, you're going to notice that the, the creek looks uh, markedly different from the upstream to the downstream end. Downstream, you're going to probably see an overwidening of the channel. You can see a lot of scour on the outside of the banks where that water's kind of pouring over the ends of the, the um, low water crossing. Uh, water lines can do a uh, similar thing, and then as I talked about, check dams can also do that. Uh, looking at the uh, pattern of the river or the, the plan form of the river, if you're you know, your bird flying in the sky and look down at the river and see how it's meandering through the valley, uh, we look at things like radius of curvature. Uh, we look at the amplitude of the um, sine wave of the, of the stream. Uh, we look at how far apart our meander bends are from one another. And so it, anytime you start modifying or changing uh, the plan view of a stream channel, you have the potential to affect its stability. Um, you know, one way that that's commonly done is where you know, stream channels are straightened out. Um, one of the things that you know, we, we try to look at uh, is get a historical perspective of what stream channels look like in northwest Arkansas uh, as far back as we can go. One of the tools we use is the 1831 GLO survey where after the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. government hired surveyors to come out and survey every section line 
uh, in the uh, western half of the United States. So uh, in doing so, those surveyors took down copious notes, took down what type of vegetation they were seeing. When they came across a stream channel, they would measure out the width of the channel. Uh, and then, so that gives you a wealth of information. And they would also uh, sketch out what they saw out there. And so you can take uh, those hand-drawn maps, digitize them, put them in the GIS, overlay them on top of maybe your project site, and you can get a good idea of what the stream channel uh, may have looked like in 1831. Uh, another source is just historical era photography. You can get from the uh, National Archives uh, historical era photos uh, back as far as 1940 for most of the area up here. Uh, in the urban areas, you can get photos from 1925. Again, you, you, know, you buy those, you can bring them to the office, digitize them, geo-reference them, and you can get a layout and, and see what the stream might have looked like at that time. Uh, but one of the common um, impacts uh, that we see on streams is straightening. You know, maybe where somebody's trying to get a little bit more acreage to farm, uh, they might have straightened that thing out. We're seeing that a lot of these streams were straightened before we even really have any good visual evidence from aerial photography. Uh, I didn't bring it with me, but I've got a great DuPont ad from 1932, and it's like, you know, our dynamite is the best thing for straightening out those unruly creeks, and, you know, they just loaded up the ground with dynamite and just blew it that, you know, just blew it up, and then all of a sudden the creek's going down along the side of the mountain instead of being out in the middle of the valley in the way of somebody's ag field. So, you know, it's, it's we, we've seen rivers and streams the way they are for so long that we've kind of grown accustomed to it. It's like, yeah, that's the way it is, uh, but there's been a lot of impacts, and some of them are hard to imagine that, you know, we would do something like that, but it's been done. Uh, these are just some examples of some of those parameters, radius of curvature. One of the things we look at as far as radius of curvature is we'll relate that to the width of the stream channel. And if the radius of curvature to the width of the stream channel is, say, less than a ratio of 2.5, we know that that's too tight of a radius for that stream to maintain that type of radius. It's just too tight as far as efficiently moving that water through. You can imagine if, if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you want to make a U-turn, you've got to slow down to make that U-turn or make a sharp turn. Well, the same thing happens on a river. That water slows down as it goes into that really sharp bend. When the water slows down, the gravel that it was carrying all of a sudden drops out of suspension. You get that deposition, then the channel starts to find a new pathway. Uh, stream profile, that's when we're looking at the side of the stream and we're watching the stream going down the valley. Uh, you're looking from upstream to downstream. We've got pools at a certain spacing apart. We'll look at pool to pool spacing look at the pool length, we'll look at the riffle length, riffle slope, pool slope. We take all those variables in when we're trying to do these restoration designs because what we're going to try to do is use an analog approach and try to mimic uh, something that we see out in nature that's stable in our restoration sites. So the profile is a very important point um, of, of emphasis, especially because, you know, the, the slope of the stream channel and these pools are energy dissipators. So we're looking at slope and we're looking at pools. Uh, those two things have a big impact on how that stream behaves and transports sediment. Uh, if we were going to do a restoration and we made that stream too flat, the bed load coming from upstream would get in there and wouldn't, wouldn't move. It'd drop out on us. We'd have an degrading channel. It'd fill up with sediment. So uh, that's a real important component to the restoration process. And this kind of just gives you an example of the, the morphology that we see out there. Uh, you know, typically what you'll have uh, starting at a riffle, you move through the riffle, it goes into a pool. There's a little section in there that we call a run. It's just a little bit steeper portion where the water tails out. You'll see kind of the water's disturbed, but it's, uh, it's slowing down as it enters the pool. Uh, after the pool, you'll have a glide. That's the long, flat part of, at the end of a pool. Uh, that's the primary spawning habitat for a lot of fish species. So having the right type of design in your, your pool geometry as far as what that glide looks like, how long it is, what kind of depth it maintains is real important as far as uh, aquatic habitat. Uh, being in low impact development, I'm sure you guys have talked a lot about hydrology and the effect, effects of anthropogenic change in watersheds on hydrology. So obviously anytime you have a stream uh, was once in, a, in an ag uh, area and has been converted into Walmarts and a lot of uh, impervious surfaces, you're going to have an increase of uh, frequency in storm runoff, and you're also going to have an increase in the peak flow of that runoff uh, unless you start incorporating some, uh, you know, att attenuation uh, methods, uh, retention, uh, and or increasing infiltration, disconnecting the impervious surfaces from directly running into uh, the stream network. Uh, so 
that's, you know, that's the big thing that we're looking at as far as a lot of the impacts in the urban environment. It's just purely a function of more water, more frequently, less bed load. If you think about it, um, you know, if you used to have just these small uh, sub-watersheds, maybe they're just a quarter of an acre, but it's only, a, you know, a foot-wide little drainage. Even that little drainage is contributing some bed load, some gravel to that stream system. As we build out and build out, then we diminish how much bed load is in that channel. We get eventually to some places to a point where we call it a clear water discharge where all the runoff comes off, there's no bed load anymore, and you've just got a lot of hungry water. So if you don't have a, be a bedrock basement in that type of stream network, that river is just going to keep cutting itself down, cutting itself down, banks are going to fall in. Uh, and so that instigates a lot of uh, instability. Uh, the opposite can be true, though. Uh, you can have a reservoir that actually starves your river from having the hydrology. If you've got a really low lake level and you get, you know, your annual storm events and most of that water doesn't make it to the other side of the, the dam, then you actually have uh, a diminished hydrologic effect from those reservoirs. Uh, sediment supply, just talked a little bit about that uh, as far as uh, increasing pervious surfaces. Uh, another uh, cause of decreased sediment supply is, is kind of going to the traditional armoring of the stream banks to try to harden uh, the channel and prevent, you know, any impacts to adjacent infrastructure. Uh, but a situation like this obviously diminishes the amount of sediment that's generated. Uh, increased sources, stream bank erosion is obvious. And then also just, you know, mass earth failures associated with uh, development. Uh, this particular uh, photo is off of I-540. If you drive 540, you can find a lot of places where there's just a, a lot of sediment that's been, being generated by filled disposal areas. Um, and then if you float um, the West Fork of the White River along 540 and you look at some of these small little tributaries, you'll just see huge plumes of sediment coming out of these uh, smaller tributaries. So uh, sediment supply, because of mass earth failures, uh, can definitely increase. Now, I mentioned before, we, we have qualitative and we have quantitative methods of evaluating stability. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, setting up tow pins, and that allows us to measure uh, the lateral rate of erosion. Uh, we also install uh, devices called scour chains, which are, uh, uh, as the name implies, they're chains that are attached to a duckbill anchor, drive them below uh, the bed surface. Uh, and then you come back a year later, excavate the bed surface, and see how much that chain is laid over. That gives you an idea of uh, the fluidization of that bed. You know, is this stream channel moving one foot of gravel, lifting it up and moving it down? Is it moving six inches, two inches? So that gives us an idea of, of what the uh, mobilization properties are of the stream channel. And uh, then also looking at, you know, I got changes in profile, but changes in general, looking at whether it's in cross-section, whether it's in pattern, or whether it's in... Uh, uh, longitudinal profile, we'll look at those uh, through uh, either a total station survey or we'll just set up discrete cross sections and evaluate those to see if those are changing year in and year out. So there's a number of methods that have been used uh, historically for managing these streams once they become unstable. And we, look, we saw uh, the situation where banks were being armored. Uh, there's uh, approaches uh, such as bank stabilization where that's really just kind of treating, if you've got an eroding stream bank, you're treating that one particular bank versus uh, where you're maybe looking at the system in whole and trying to get some equilibrium uh, between all those properties we've been talking about. Uh, straightening, you know, a lot of people, you know, really like the idea of, well, let's just get the water out of here, run it down, get it out. Um, obviously, that has an impact on your uh, downstream uh, recipients of that excess uh, velocity water. Uh, it also has a potential impact upstream. Uh, anytime you start straightening a stream out, you create potential for uh, what we call a head cut. And, and essentially, that's just a lowering of that base elevation of the bottom of the channel that just migrates upstream until it hits a nick point. Maybe it hits a, a bedrock outcrop or something like that. And then you end up with a waterfall. But in the meantime, everything downstream of that had cut down a couple feet. Um, channel clearing, uh, you know, getting that vegetation out of there, that's causing us problems. That, that's why we're unstable is because of the vegetation. Uh, it's effective generally in the short term, but not necessarily a long-term fix. Uh, bioengineering, and I'd really I'd put bioengineering and, and natural channel design in the same, same boat. We're really just trying to work with nature and, and make it as natural appearing as possible when we do these restorations projects. And we're trying to meet multiple objectives rather than just one singular objective, say, stabilize the stream bank and prevent it from eroding. 
And then natural channel design uh, is the approach that we, we take on our restoration projects. And then we incorporate, uh, you know, some elements of, you know, some of these other approaches. You know, this is kind of our tool box, and then there are a couple tools in there that we also incorporate to try to make the best restoration uh, possible. So what is natural channel design? Uh, essentially, natural channel design uh, seeks to uh, restore streams uh, using the natural tendencies of rivers. And as I mentioned before, we'll go out and we'll seek out stable stream channels that we can extract some of those physical properties, the, the width versus the depth, or um, looking at uh, the pool-to-pool -pool spacing. Now, you can't just take uh, the attributes from a stream and just wholesale apply it to the stream you're trying to fix. You've got to scale them up or down depending on the size of the drainage area that's contributing to each of your sites. So that's where we start looking at uh, dimensionless ratios of these physical attributes, like I mentioned, width to depth ratio. So we're looking at the channel width divided by the bank full depth. Um, we'll take that ratio, say it's 15, and we'll apply that ratio 15 to our restoration site. And then we would scale up 15, well, if it's a uh, you know, 10 foot wide channel uh, or you know, we want it to be a 15-foot wide channel, then the bank full depth would just be one foot. Um, but the, the natural channel design, it's an analog approach uh, to, to doing these restoration projects. Uh, but, you know, to this date, there's really nothing out there that you can get from a textbook that says, okay, there's a river over here. Go fix it. Here's the way you should fix it. You need to have your pool spacing this far. You need to have your cross-section be this much for your given drainage area. So you have to kind of rely on you know, what's available out there to give you an idea of where you need to go on these restoration projects. Um, and, you know, and, and streams are variable. So, you know, there's nothing absolute about, you know, you measure the attributes at one site. They have to be exactly identical. You've got site constraints you've got to work around. But this at least gives you a template to start working in the right direction. Um, I've mentioned this term several times today, uh, but I needed really to define it for you guys. And, uh, when, when using this natural channel design approach, we rely on a concept called bankful discharge. It's also analogous to what you might call the effective discharge, and that's the, the flow that's going through your stream that does most of the work. Uh, certainly, you're going to have most of the time of the year, you're going to have very little flow. But the stream power at that point is insufficient to move any gravel. You're not really forming the channel during those flows. And then, of course, some years you're going to have just mega floods, and, but those are infrequent and rare, so they're not necessarily the channel forming floods. We look at this bank full flow as the flow that occurs on a regular enough basis where we consider it to be that discharge that's uh, creating the channel shape. And essentially, you know, in the field uh, looking for bank full, uh, what we're looking at is a feature in cross section that shows that the stream channel, uh, the water in the stream channel is at a flooding stage where it just gets out of the channel and starts to spread out. As it spreads out, then all of a sudden you have a reduced shear stress because your depth isn't increasing much anymore. Uh, this particular stream channel is just right about at Bankful. You can see how this water is real flat over here. Uh, the edge of the channel is probably right, you know, a couple feet off of that. And so this is really close to what we would call Bankful, the incipient point of flooding. Uh, depending on where you are in, in the country, uh, the return interval for that type of flow event uh, can range from 1.2 all the way up to two and a half. If you're in Arizona, there, there are bank full return periods that are, you know, two, two and a half years, but that's because the spacing of those flood events or those storm events is, is broader than it is in a, a more uh, wet climate like we have here in northwest Arkansas. Well, wet most years. Um, in, in northwest Arkansas, it's about 1.2 to 1.7 is the return period. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at and, and uh, we get a lot of our information from USGS gauging stations. And what those do is those provide us a statistical uh, base from which to evaluate whether or not we've met bankful. So if I go out to a site and I measure the physical properties and I calculate that the discharge is 300 CFS, and if I've got a gauge station just up the street and I go look at the gauge station, the return period for a 300 CFS flow is 10 years, I know that I've overestimated that, uh, that feature that I consider to be bank full. So I'd go out and go and reevaluate that uh, site to see, well, is there another place where the water's starting to spread out uh, at a lower elevation? And it works both ways. 
but through the analysis of all the gauges that are in, in northwest Arkansas, we found that uh, the duration of bankful events is about 72 hours on an annual basis. And that doesn't mean you have one flood event where the water's up, like on the Mississippi River, where it's flooded for 72 hours straight. It's You've got two or three storm events that happen during the year that get out above bankful, and the accumulation of those uh, flood events give you about 72 hours per year on average. So with that in mind and, and kind of the, the background and, and some of the points that we use for restoration uh, designs and in, in our kind of philosophy of approaching uh, these projects, I uh, wanted to show you a few of our projects that we've worked on in northwest Arkansas and uh, give you a little bit more information on those and, and some of the constraints that we had to overcome and, and some of the uh, considerations that we had to make. Uh, one of our projects on the West Fork of the White River near Brentwood, uh, so that's south of West Fork, uh, we completed in the spring of 2009. Uh, goal of the project, which was a 319 funded project. 319 is a subsection of the Clean Water Act and, uh, and in that 319 program the EPA distributes money to state programs to implement uh, conservation projects that address non-point source pollution. So this particular project was funded through 319 money. Uh, and in doing those projects, you, you have to demonstrate certain things and you have to present uh, certain outcomes as part of the requirements of the grant. So the goal of this project was to demonstrate and implement a, a restoration project uh, using this natural channel design approach in a rural environment. Uh, this gives you a little bit more background on the location of, of our project site. Uh, the drainage area for this site was about 18 square miles. It's a rural watershed, it's primarily in forest. It's got some uh, pasture land. Uh, the project length was about 1,600 feet. Uh, the stream channel type, uh, just to give you a little back, bit of background on, on the nomenclature that I've got there, um, I think you saw earlier in my definition of stream stability, uh, and, and Dr. Sorens mentioned earlier, he took a class uh, from uh, Dr. Dave Rosgen. He's a guy who's been studying rivers for 30 years uh, and has really uh, helped the science of, of stream restoration to evolve. And one of the things that he's developed is a stream classification system so that practitioners when, when they mention what kind of stream type it is, they don't have to go into a lot of detail with adjectives. They can just call out a, a, a letter and a number, and then all of a sudden the person they're talking to knows what they're talking about as far as what does the stream look like, what kind of gravels in the stream, uh, what's its slope look like, what's the cross-section look like. So uh, a C4 stream type, uh, without getting into too, too much detail, is a stream channel that's uh, not really entrenched very much. That is, it hasn't dropped down uh, the base elevation hasn't dropped down so far that it can't ever access the floodplain. Uh, it's a gentle gradient stream. Uh, the four represents what type of substrate. Four is a gravel substrate. Three would be cobble. Uh, two would be boulder. One would be bedrock. Uh, five would be sand. And six would be silt. Uh, at our particular project, we had three landowners. That's something that you always, you know, if you, if you do any of this type of work, you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have multiple landowners, multiple objectives. Everybody's got a little bit different component or idea of how they want that um, restoration to take place. Um, and then they also have, you know, differing philosophies on why the channel is the way it is and, and what you ought to do about it. Uh, so we try to overwhelm them or uh, placate them with data. You know, we want to show them what we're doing why we're doing it, and why it's important. So one of the things uh, that we did on this particular project, and I talked about you know, measuring erosion rates and tow pins. On this site, we established seven tow pins that allowed us to measure the erosion rate over uh, a one-year period. And, and in doing so, then we can start to calculate, well, there's this many tons of sediment, there's this many pounds of phosphorus, and then people can start getting their head around, well, why is this an impact as far as water quality goes? Uh, this, uh, illustrates where our, our tow pen sites were located. And then on the left kind of gives you a, an illustration of what we're talking about when we're doing these measurements. Um, this line here on the right is the bank profile uh, during the original survey. Let me just jump back here. So in measuring this profile, we take this vertical survey rod, hold it square, and then use a horizontal leveling rod to measure the distance from the rod to the bank. And then we'll take another measurement from the rod to the bank and do that progressively up the bank as we have any changes in the profile. And so this is the profile of that stream bank. Sorry, 
This is the profile of the stream bank during the first year. And then you come back the second year and you measure it. And so this area in here can then be quantified, uh, converted into a volume, and then using a bulk density value for the material in the stream bank can be uh, uh, actual mass of material can be calculated from that. Uh, I don't have any pictures of it, but I guess it's a good time to talk about some of the other things we're doing on our projects is we're actually uh, sampling this bank material to get an idea of what the bulk density is and what the nutrient and colloidal content is of those stream banks. Uh, because obviously a sand bank or a silt bank is going to have different chemical physical properties than a stream bank that's just full of uh, gravels and cobbles. You're going to have a lot more inert material in this stream bank, so when a a ton of this washes away, uh, you may only have, uh, you know, I don't know, 0.3 pounds per ton of, of, of phosphorus. Now, if you had a stream bank that's silt, uh, you might have as much as 0.7 pounds of phosphorus per ton of bank material. So the type of substrate obviously makes a big difference, and one of the things we've been trying to do is just be able to more precisely predict what kind of sediment and nutrient loads are coming from these eroding banks, is to physically take samples of those stream banks sieve them out, send them to the lab for chemical analysis. So at this particular site, um, based on our measurements, we were looking at about uh, 2,000 tons per year of sediment coming from stream bank erosion. Looking at the restoration design itself, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of landowner objectives and site constraints. Um, you know, obviously, everybody was wanting to reduce stream bank erosion but you know, some, sometimes the ideal alternative for these restoration projects is to increase the amount of floodplain that the river has access to. Um, but then some landowners are not real interested in giving up any more pasture than they've already lost. You, know, you can sometimes push that discussion to the point where, well, if we don't do anything, you're going to lose that property regardless. So maybe the best way to do this is kind of split it down the middle, and we're going to use a little bit of that pasture for a floodplain. Uh, we had landowners that wanted low water crossings. They were having to frequently maintain their low water crossings, so we're trying to incorporate that type of concept into the design where we're not creating a cross-channel obstruction like we talked about before, but something that moves the gravel through but provides a hard base uh, for vehicular traffic. And everybody wanted to have swimming and fishing holes. So in developing this design, again, a lot of data is collected, but you know, I've got to emphasize that uh, where we might use an analog approach in trying to pick out some of these variables for the restoration design, we still have to get back in there and, and look at you know, the physical properties of the stream and are we going to be able to meet the, the requirements that the watershed is going to give us? Are we going to have the right type of cross-section and slope to move that bankful discharge through there? And then sediment transport. We'll look at the velocity of the water, we'll look at the depth, and we'll calculate how much shear is available in that stream channel. The other thing we'll do is go out to our point bar and start looking at the biggest rocks that are out there on that point bar. If we don't have enough shear to move those bigger rocks, then we know we don't have enough energy in our restoration to actually keep all the gravel moving through there during a flood event. So that's a big component of the restoration design is making sure that we have enough uh, competence that is, the stream has enough energy to move the gravel. And we also look at, does it have enough capacity to move all the material through there during a given storm event? Uh, this particular site had a, a, a discharge, a design discharge of 725 uh, cubic feet per second. It's cross-sectional area of 135 uh, square feet. Bankful slope, 0 0.0064 feet per feet. And then this is where I was talking about that bankful shear. You know, does that 0.84 pounds per foot square will it move the type of material that we need to move through our project site. The other thing we'll use this number for is sizing our rocks for our structures and having an adequate margin of safety to where most of those rocks will stay in place, assuming you know, something doesn't happen unforeseen. Uh, but there, you know, with this type of approach, you know, you've got to uh, take into account that you're going to have situations where you don't have control over the entire uh, environment that you're working in. You can't uh, control what's going on upstream. You can't control if a tree falls in, a mile upstream, comes through your project site, root wad attaches to one of your rocks, pulls that rock in. Um, so there's always that potential where you're going to have damage. But, you know, in doing these projects and going in this direction where you're going to use uh, these approaches to maintain a natural looking channel that provides all the 
benefits that you're looking for, aesthetics, aquatic habitat, water quality improvements, safety, improved fishing, then you're going to have to accept a little bit of uncertainty in terms of what might happen to these projects over the long haul. Uh, in saying that, uh, these projects, we're always trying to incorporate maintenance funding so that there's some sort of mechanism to where if we do have a large magnitude flood event and there is damage, then we can get back in there and do some repairs. Uh, if you let these things go, you, know, you have a rock come out of place or you have some scour somewhere and you say, ah, we're just going to let the vegetation come in and take care of it, generally what happens is it gets worse before it gets better and then you end up losing the whole project. So expedient uh, repair of these sites is important uh, and definitely is a consideration when you start budgeting for implementing one of these projects. Uh, the general approach to the restoration design, if you look at this site, you know, you can, uh, well, I got a lot of information on there. Let's do this. That is the pathway that the river took before we did restoration. And I think the thing that's most obvious is you've got two really, really sharp bends. And remember I talked about rays of curvature and bankful width ratios. Uh, this was definitely less than uh, two and a half. It was less than two. And so generally what was happening is water was just screaming down the valley, and it would hit this sharp bend, drop out all of its sediment in this bend, and then scour uh, the bank down valley direction. And as it did that, it started turning itself to the point where it was running back up the valley. And I guarantee any time you see a river starting to go back up the valley, there's something that's not right with that stream system. The river's supposed to go down the valley, not back up. So the, the approach was to take some of those tight radius uh, curvatures out and implement a design that had a little bit gentler uh, radius but was still capable of moving all the sediment and moving our water through there. Uh, we, as much as possible, we try to maintain stream length, uh, which is really difficult to do if you've got something going back up the valley. Uh, but the main thing was we want to, didn't want to create a stream that was overly steep, and, uh, and then that would mean we'd have too much energy, and it would be a lot harder to uh, maintain our, our riffles through the site. Uh, one of the things that we did, and I'll talk a little bit about our wetlands, uh, is created, you could call them a number of things. We call them wetlands. You could call them oxbow ponds. Uh, you could call them uh, also stormwater treatment. Uh, you see a gravel road here. There's also a gravel road here. All that water was concentrated and would run into the stream in this section here. So we've actually got some in-stream uh, channel stormwater benefits uh, through having these wetlands created. Uh, if you look at this first wetland, it's full of fine silt and chert. You get down a little bit further to the next pond, the water's clear, there's not as much uh, silt and sediment, and then you get down to these last two and the water's just uh, really clear. So we got a kind of a stormwater benefit out of implementing those uh, wetlands in this old meander uh, that we cut off. Uh, the air, these uh, air photos kind of show you what the site looked like prior to restoration and then after. Uh, the air photo on the right is from 2010. Uh, you can see the structures that we uh, integrated into the design. Uh, we've got a number of uh, what we call J hooks, and uh, and then this is the low water crossing uh, that we put in. Uh, essentially, it was a uh, oh, it's an armored channel bottom that kind of mimics the shape of the channel. So what we're able to do is then maintain the grade of that channel, uh, but at the same time move gravel and sediment through there. Instead of you know, if we had uh, concrete and culverts, we'd get a lot of deposition on the upstream end of that. Uh, just a little bit talking about the, the structures. You know, we primarily relying on uh, on the J-hook rock veins. Uh, we also try to incorporate uh, a log vein uh, into that design. Uh, short veins, they're just shorter than the J-hook vein. Rock sizing, like I mentioned, it's based on the shear force. Uh, for this particular project, we, you know, the minimum size of rock we wanted to use was one ton per rock. But the bigger, the better on this restoration. So we had some rocks that pushed four or five tons. I mean, just really big rocks. And those are some of those rocks that were just, you know, really huge. Um, you know, kind of pushing the limit of the equipment that we've got out there uh, for, for putting these rocks into place. The structures at this site, you know, the, the, the length of these structures is going to be directly correlated to the width of the stream channel. So, you know, at Sweetbriar Park, stream channel was 36 feet uh, wide. Those structures are 36 to 40 feet long. Uh, this particular stream channel uh, was about 60 feet wide. Structures were about 50 foot long. Um, 
Revegetation is a critical component in any of these projects. I mean, you can go in and you can put the rocks in the stream and you can go through the engineering and get the stabilized channel, uh, but the vegetation is a critical component to actually achieving restoration. It, uh, the, you know, the biggest thing is it provides you stability. And, uh, you know, by having that vegetation in place, having the root mass in there, holding, binding your gravels together, it's going to withstand your larger flood events a lot better. Uh, obviously, it provides habitat and forage and improves the aesthetics of the site. I mean, you know, looking at this, these areas right here, had we not done any revegetation, it'd just be a ginormous gravel area. You know, so uh, when we do these projects, we definitely try to incorporate the riparian buffer as part of the restoration project uh, to improve the overall ecological performance and also uh, just the uh, erosion performance of the site. Uh, as far as identifying native species, there's a lot of good sources out there for identifying native species, uh, but I'll go also back to that 1831 survey. Uh, those surveyors, they would write down just about every plant they saw when they were going across the creek channel, so it gives you a real solid foundation for you know, what kind of plants should be there and, and then maybe which ones you might want to you know, exclude from your list. And then this is important for whatever project you might ever be working on if you're doing a reclamation project. You can't just walk away from your, your plants. Obviously, like a year like this year, you know, if you're not out there, if you planted plants in the spring and you're not out there now irrigating them, they're not going to be here next year. So um, that's something that you have to consider when you're starting to develop your budgets for these projects is, look, we, we want our contractor to come out and irrigate these sites, at least for the first year, to maintain our vegetation and uh, give them a help, uh, you know, helping hand as far as survival rates. Uh, one of the things we used on the West Fork, which uh, was convenient and is a lot easier to do in rural environments uh, than it is in urban environments, is to use sod mats as your uh, kind of your vegetative starting point. And what we did in that case is we went to the round, around the perimeter of the pasture that was associated with the project site with that front end loader and would just scoop up a whole sod mat with that front end loader. And in that sod mat, we had a lot of native species, a lot of fescue and coral berry, some rough leaf dogwood that then you can just put at the edge of the stream channel and you have instant vegetation, instant erosion control, and more place, uh, more substrate to actually plant more plants into. Uh, obviously, you're not going to have a lot of success just planting into straight gravel, so anytime you can incorporate more soil into the design, uh, you're going to have more success. So just looking at kind of uh, before and after uh, on this site, we'll look at some before photos. Uh, granted, these are taken in winter. Uh, but, you know, this is pretty much the condition of the whole site, you know, just all the way along the entire site. You've got eroding stream banks. Um, you've got large trees uh, falling into the stream channel. Uh, and that's, you know, a point I'd like to make. I mean, uh, tree planting can be very successful in maintaining stable riparian areas and improving the quality of riparian areas. But just mere tree planting alone isn't going to bring a, a stream channel into very uh, rapid equilibrium. Uh, I mean, you can imagine, if, if trees like this are falling in, uh, what good is it going to do me to plant, uh, you know, uh, bare root seedlings along uh, the pasture over here where the stream bank is where it's just not going to do any good. I mean, it's going to be throwing money out the window. So, you know, it, it, in certain, certain cases, tree planting is going to work for you. Situations like these, I mean, and this is that gravel bar I was talking about that was just depositing, continue to push the river downstream. Uh, you know, You've got to address this problem before you can address it with trees. Uh, these are old gas lines that used to uh, supply natural gas to some swine facilities that were located uh, about a half a mile away on top of the hill. But at one point, these all these ran through earth. They, they, you know, they never saw the light of day. And so this kind of gives you an idea, if, you know, if these are running out this way, how much erosion has taken place over time at this site. And then again, here's the, on the downstream end, a little bit more of the same erosion. And then finally, you know, if you get to a river and it looks like this, you can be pretty certain that it's got some problems that need to be addressed. I mean, it looks like a bomb went off. you got trees everywhere. you got root wads in the middle of the river. Here's some more trees. The deposition is r random and haphazard. Uh, you know, this is a pretty good indicator uh, that the stream was unstable. And then uh, looking at the site after we finished the restoration work, uh, this is starting at the upstream end. You can see some of our structures. Uh, this is looking back from where the previous photo was taken. Uh, our low water crossing is right here. You can see that. And you can see how it's kind of shaped, you know, to have slope comes down to the bottom and then comes back up to a flat up on top. 
Uh, this is a J-hook vein. We leave spaces in the rocks to allow bed load to move through there so they don't get plugged up uh, quite as easily. Uh, sometimes that will happen, though. You'll get those spaces to, they'll get plugged up on you. Uh, this is looking at uh, the larger of the five J-hooks we have on site. And this is where we have some of those five, six ton boulders in there. Um, some of the vegetation, cardinal flower. This is the area where we cut the new channel through, where we abandoned the river channel. The old river channel went back through here and came, came around and then came back down in here. Uh, this is our new channel. We included some what we call habitat rocks uh, just to kind of increase the microhabitat in these riffles instead of it just being a, a kind of a uniform, homogenous riffle running downstream, trying to integrate some of these boulders to create some, create some micro pools along in that riffle. And then this is the downstream end, a couple more J-hooks to finish out the project. Uh, one of the things uh, that we're always trying to do is incorporate this bank full bench into our restoration designs. And I think, you know, at Sweet Priority, you probably noticed that. You know, you had the top of the bank, it sloped down, then it was flat, and then it went down, went into the water. And here's one of those bankful benches. Um, the reason being, we, we want to have this structure running up to what we call our bankful elevation. And we don't want the water just cascading over the back side of it. We want it to be spread out kind of like it was in a, a small little flood on this floodplain. Uh, this elevation up here is actually the top of a levee that extended along the entire project length. And so one of the things we did, instead of just taking out this levee wholesale, I mean, there's a lot of valuable vegetation up there providing shade and cover and habitat, uh, is we put perforations in that levee. So about every couple hundred feet, we just took a small chunk of the levee out to allow that water to spread out into the adjacent pasture. And I mentioned the wetlands. This is just kind of giving you an idea of what those look like. So this is the old river channel. This is where you know, the vertical cut bank with the pipes coming out of the side of the, the bank wall. Um, this is what it looks like after, you know, uh, moving the stream to the other location. Uh, one thing that's uh, interesting about these wetlands, or you may consider it atypical, we, we would call it a wetland. Uh, it rises and falls. We call it an ephemeral, ephemeral riverine wetland. So the water level in these wetlands rises and falls with the water level in the river. So when you're in, you know, you just had a big rain, maybe got two or three inches of water, and the, the river is up. Well, these wetlands also come up just from that percolation, the uh, transmissivity of the, the gravels allow water to get in there during higher flood stages and then as the river drops then these drop. Um, and then you can see here, I mean this is the same wetland complex as, as the previous photo but you can see how much lower the water is now. Again that's during high water and then this is in low water. So um, that finishes up the, the West Fork. Dr. Shorns, how much time do I have? Yeah. Another half hour? Okay. Um, I'm going to burn through this one. We'll get to like before, after, look at a couple of videos, uh, because a lot of this is going <laughs> to... Well, what are you going to do? Go for a run? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I also want to show you some sweet briar pictures since you guys went out there. I want to give you kind of perspective of what that site looked like before, and, and then maybe we can talk about some of the, the issues that uh, surfaced during the flooding this past spring. So uh, this is the Gully Park site. Um, you guys did go to this yesterday to go the entire length from township, I don't know, like 1,200 feet. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, so this is that project. Um, this obviously was before we did the restoration, and this was oh, about two weeks after the restoration was completed. Um, you know, it... And this is the thing I like about this. I have to explain. This is what the site used to look like. I mean, if you went out there uh, three years ago, there were several places that were just like this. Uh, plenty of potential for, you know, kid on his bike to just do an endo over the end and face plane into the bottom. So, uh, you know, it was a safety hazard. It was a water quality issue. It was an aesthetic issue. It kind of detracted from the park aesthetics, just having these you know, exposed cut banks. The city was, you know, sometimes they put out the orange fencing and the poles and, and that would get washed away and then it would be back to this condition. And so it was kind of in a, a, you know, a sad state for, for quite a while. And um, uh, with the City of Fayetteville providing uh, match funding, uh, this project was also uh, 
it's funded primarily through the 319 grant program. Uh, and that grant, and I mentioned the EPA distributes, it, uh, distributes that money to the state entities. Uh, it's the Arkansas Natural Resources Commission. That is the state agency that's responsible for implementing the 319 program here in Arkansas. You guys were there yesterday, so you know where it's at. Uh, you know, the main thing was, you know, we looked at a lot of different sites in the city and then ultimately decided on Gully Park. Uh, there's no shortage of, of project sites that, you know, you could implement a restoration project on both within the city, the county, uh, the state. I mean, there's just, we, we all could do this work for a long, long time, provided the money was there and, and still have more to, uh, to do, just based on the extent of impacts that we've had on the water, you know, our stream networks. And I mentioned, you know, uh, that our natural channel design approach philosophy, we're really trying to achieve multiple objectives. So, you know, that, that's what I really like about the approach is we can get a lot of things done uh, and still maintain that natural aesthetic. Uh, this is on the downstream end of the project site, so giving you an idea of what those stream banks uh, look like before. Now, using that Rosgen stream classification system again, a B4 stream type is a stream channel that has cut down somewhat. It's got a moderate slope, it's got a low sinuosity, and it's got a gravel bed. So, I mean, I, I, I just have to say B4 to a lot of people, and they're like, yeah, I got you. Um, but uh, that's, that's what we had out there. Uh, it was relatively steep. It's got a lot of energy when the water gets up in there. And um, it has a lot of energy when we have really large magnitude storm events. As you can see here, it takes a lot of water before it's getting out onto this. We call this a terrace. The floodplain is actually down here in the wooded riparian area. It's maybe one or two feet above the elevation of the water surface here. This is what we would call a terrace. Uh, it rarely gets inundated. You saw where the project's uh, limit, or you saw the project yesterday. It, essentially, the limits of the project uh, were from the upstream portion of the park, uh, just below a uh, waterline crossing, uh, to the downstream end of the, the park project. And in the air photo from uh, 2008, you can see here are those cut banks. We've got one here, we've got one here, and there's one here. Um, the general approach on this site wasn't to you know, wholesale get in there and reshape the entire channeling. Uh, there's some segments in there that just had enough natural vegetation. Maybe they even had bedrock sidewalls or uh, they had sidewalls that were primarily made of layered uh, shale. And so they weather a, a lot slower than uh, just an exposed gravel bank. So we didn't necessarily have to go through and reshape and rebuild the entire channel. We tried to isolate those areas that needed the most help. Uh, we did Again, we did the uh, toe pin measurements. Uh, that allowed us to quantify you know, what the, the loading of our various pollutants are. Uh, and that's something that after we finish the project, then we come back you know, to uh, our grantors and say, look, we did this project, and then we kept 110,000 pounds of sediment from getting into the creek this year. But that's something that happens every year, 110, 110, 110. So after a 10-year period, you've got a million uh, pounds of sediment that you've kept from getting into that creek. So you know, your cost per pound of, of sediment reduced greatly decreases over time. Uh, obviously the big one in our part of the country is the amount of total phosphorus reduction, uh, 29 pounds of phosphorus per year. Uh, you know, and these erosion rates, I was talking 20 foot, 200 foot before, it's all you know, a matter of perspective. Uh, if you're the city of Fayetteville and you're losing seven tenths of foot a year and you've got a trail that's three feet away from the edge of the stream bank, that's a big number. You know, you're talking three years, now your trail has to be moved or relocated. Um, or, you know, conversely, there's a, a water line that runs along and parallel to the stream channel, like uh, frequently occurs, because those are just easy uh, right-of-way access areas. Uh, you know, if your 36-inch water line is five feet away and you run eroding at seven, seven tenths a foot per year, you know, five years, and then you're talking about some maintenance of, of significant magnitude in terms of dealing with that water line. Constraints, uh, you get in an urban environment, your constraint requirements uh, go way up. Uh, you start talking about not increasing uh, the, the elevation of the 100-year flood because you've got adjacent property owners that don't want to have uh, to increase or have to add flood insurance to their properties. Uh, you've got infrastructure, whether it be water lines or its trails or its bridges. Um, and then, you know, once you have these things in place, then it really limits, well, what can you do with this stream channel? You get boxed in more and more and more. Uh, 
assuming that you're not going to move a sewer line, which just wouldn't be cost effective to do that. Uh, depending on which community you're working in, you're going to have concerns about tree preservation and, and not damaging the existing vegetation. Uh, and Fayetteville is one of those communities, so we had to tread really lightly, get the smallest excavator we could that could get underneath the canopy, could get down in the stream channel, but still could handle the rocks that we needed to, to move around. And then uh, in this particular case, if you've been to Gully Park, you know it's a busy park. A lot of people out there. Uh, and so you, know, you had to have a certain amount of uh, crowd control and uh, outreach on site because everybody wants to know what are you doing out here. Why are you in the creek digging around with an excavator? Uh, we're here to help. And uh, so you have to go through that process. Uh, same type of design approach uh, for this restoration as the other. Uh, the, you know, the main thing being finding a, a suitable reference reach. In this particular case, there's one back behind, uh, I think it's called Vandergriff Elementary School out there on Highway 45. Uh, real nice section. I mean, you can look at that and say, yeah, that's a good looking stream channel. It's doing its thing. It's not, you know, we don't have cut eroding banks. I've got you know, nice side slopes on the stream channel and it's moving the water and gravel through there. So this kind of gave us a real good template for, you know, how we wanted to set up our, our sectional dimensions. Uh, and really, uh, the drainage area wasn't all that different than what we were working in. Uh, we used a number of structures out there. I think uh, uh, you probably saw the cross vein is on the upstream end of the project site, a uh, number of J-hooks, three-quarter ton per rock. Again, that's a minimum. We probably have some that are two or three. Uh, you know, you, you can never have enough margin of safety. And, and the way I look at it, on these structures, the bigger the rock is, the more natural it looks because you don't have all these like stacked rocks. It looks a little bit more like a, a continuous bedrock outcropping maybe coming out of the side of the, of the stream bank. We're, we're big into plants, but you know, like on a site like this, uh, you just have to get out there and start vegetating. If you, if you wait for you know, the right weather or the right time or the right plant, you need to be ready to go as, as the excavator gets out you need to be starting to plant that thing um, because chances are it's going to rain its tail off as soon as you get done with you know your heavy equipment work and I've, it just never fails. So just kind of looking at this thing, this time I'm going to kind of do here's area A before, here's area A after. Uh, this is the upstream portion of the project site. Um, this is the water line that runs across. Uh, this was a fiber optic line that was actually, we clamshelled this with the gray PVC but it was just exposed and sitting there, and it served as 10,000 customers and just kind of laying out there across the creek channel waiting for, you know, a wise 13-year-old kid with a buck knife to say, I wonder what's in this little plastic thing. And so anyways, that, uh, you know, AT&T was real happy that we were doing something there. So that's before, and then this is afterwards. And so here's that same water line. Uh, the fiber optic cable goes underneath somewhere in this vicinity. And here's that cross vein. And the whole principle with these structures is, if you look at them, uh, they're higher on the downstream end and then they descend as you move upstream. And what that does is as you have a, a high flow water coming through here, that water, as it travels this way, it naturally wants to fall into the middle of the stream. So what you're doing is you're concentrating your energy into the center of the stream. You're taking your high velocities away from the edge of the stream bank and trying to get that stuff into the middle of the channel. Maintaining your thaw wag and your highest velocity, thaw wag being the deepest part of the channel, maintaining your highest velocity in the center of the channel. Now, uh, one of the things that we've started to discover as we work in these urban environments and we have these entrenched systems, you know, if this is our bank full elevation, which it is, you can see how high the adjacent terrace is. This site, you know, it does great with water that's up here, it does great with water that's up here, but when we get floods like we had in April, you can imagine, now this is only half the height of my water column depth. So it started to have less impact on being able to direct that water around. So that's where you start having some problems uh, with these restoration projects is as you get to these larger and larger magnitude storm events, these structures sometimes can have less uh, impact on directing uh, velocities away from your stream bank. Uh, this is, uh, the parking lot is right up here. And again, this is one of those situations where if we weren't given the constraint of maintaining vegetation, we might like to cut this bank, instead of it being vertical, just cut a little three or four foot wide bench, something that allows the water to spread out like we've got over here, also have that on the outside of this bend. Um, but it, like the oak tree and 
you know, someday it will come down, and when it comes down, then we'll, we'll go back and, and deal with that and, and bench it out. For the short term, though, it's not really eroding that fast. This is all really hard material. If you were to measure erosion rates there, they're real small. So that was before contrast. It's hard to get good photos inside of the forest canopy on a sunny day. Um, but you, you can see one of our structures that's visible from the fence line up here next to the parking lot. Uh, that one's been doing really well. Uh, this structure here has seen its fair share of abuse just because, like I said, there's no place for the water to flood up here and there's a minimal floodplain over here. So we've got a lot of shear stress that has dislodged some of those rocks. Um, you know, and again, that's where bigger might be better in that particular case. Uh, this is in the middle of the park. Uh, this was before. I mentioned we do our bank sampling. Uh, the way we do that on, on coarse stream bank material banks is we clean off the face of the bank and we excavate with a trowel, you know, a, a hole in there. We capture all the material that comes out of that excavation hole. Then we use a polyurethane foam to fill in that hole. So then we come back the next day and it's, you know, kind of mushroomed out, but the urethane is filled in the void that's in that stream bank. And we'll take that out and we'll cut that foam off at the edge of the stream bank, dunk that and that in, into a bucket of graduated, you know, graduated bucket of some variety. And that'll give us the volume of that void. And then we can take the mass of the material we collect in our bag and uh, the volume of that void and get ourselves a bulk density for that material. So uh, that was before. Uh, this is one week after restoration. And, and like I mentioned, we get out there quick. We're, that was uh, winter wheat that we put out there. And, and that wheat uh, took off really quick. Um, so that's one week. Um, that's one year. And then that's uh, two years after. So that was last August. That was August 2010. Um, yeah, it's funny. Some people prefer that. Uh, I'm, I'm personally, I'm liking this more and more every day because the more vegetation I've got there, then the more I've got holding that stream bank together. So if you prioritize our objectives, you know, the biggest priority was to stabilize these stream banks. We've had some rocks move. We've had some things happen that we didn't expect to happen. But if you look at this and compare to what it was before, you know, the project's doing its job. So we're real stoked with that. Uh, this is a little bit further down. Uh, this is one of those places where the uh, trail is right up adjacent to the stream bank is probably three feet off the edge of that uh, top of bank. Uh, this is one week after restoration. Uh, this material is a, uh, a coconut fiber and straw inside of a quilting of uh, bi uh, photodegradable uh, poly, uh, polypropylene, which is real nice for most projects, uh, especially like just a general construction project keeps the straw there, keeps everything in place, prevents erosion. Biggest thing that we've noticed with this uh, photodegradable uh, plastic is that it likes to trap snakes and it likes to trap critters. And no matter how much you think it's going to photodegrade, you're going to go around the site and you're going to find that stuff five years from now. So we've kind of moved away from using the photodegradable uh, netting into uh, some products that have uh, just uh, their uh, pure cellulose. Um, they'll use a little cellulose to tack um, aspen fibers together, and then the aspen fibers actually have a natural curl, and so it just provides a, a, a more ecologically sustainable erosion control method. Uh, so yeah, so that's one week, uh, that's one year, and then two years after. In this particular case, you know, you'll notice that structure kind of looks atypical to the other ones. We would try, you know, we were limited on how much we could expand that stream bank because the, the trail that was right up here. So what we try to do is we kind of blended what we call a rock retaining wall and a J-hook. So it's got the properties of having stacked rock, but then you can see that these have that descending pattern as far as putting those rocks in. So they're still rolling water away from the edge of the bank, but at some point we had to just have pure hardness and roughness to prevent any more lateral erosion there. And then this is on the uh, downstream end of the project or, or getting down towards the end. Again, there we've got another sample. There's another sample in there. <clears throat> so that's before restoration. Uh, that's one week after restoration. And the reason yeah, we don't have that winter wheat coming up yet here is because this was the last place to get repaired or restored. Uh, the previous photo, uh, two sites before where it was green, that was the first place we did. So you, know, you can see what happens in a matter of about 10 days. And, and just to let you know, that was about the duration of the construction phase. It was about 10 days worth of work. Uh, but once you get done with construction, then you've just got a whole other 
set of things you've got to deal with as far as the vegetation and management component post-restoration. And then this is one year after, and uh, again, you know, I haven't got many complaints, but you know, you hear people complaining about you know, it being brushy or weedy or whatever, and um, you know, th this is what we want. This is stability incarnate, and uh, one of the things we do go through here and, and take out any invasives that we can. So first year, they were just, I mean, mimosas were, you know, probably about 10 stems per, you know, 10 square feet. They were just everywhere. So, you know, if you don't come in and manage, you know, so you go through all this effort, plant all these natives, and you walk away. If you come back in five years, it's just going to be full of invasives. So you kind of just, again, you know, you don't want to throw your money away. Uh, just to give you a kind of an idea of what this site looks like uh, at bankful condition. Now this one might. I got some other videos we can look at, but this, this illustrates the discharge that we got. You know, I mentioned you, if you build it or you know when you do these construction projects, it's going to rain on you. So uh, we finished on the 21st of August. This is the gauge station that, that is located on site. I don't know if you guys discussed that. Uh, yeah, there's a USGS station right there, big old red box up on, on stand. Um, this red line represents the bank full discharge that we designed for. And, you know, less than a week after we got the restoration in place, we had something that you know, was 50% greater than our bank full discharge design. Uh, not much later, a, a tropical storm that came through didn't have a really big peak flow. It got above our bankful discharge, but it had a pretty long duration. The longer the duration, you have more uh, gravel moving through your site. And then, you know, less than a month after finishing the restoration, another tropical storm come through there. And, you know, three times the bankful discharge. Um, and you know, so it, it's just one of those things you got to expect it, and that's why you got to start with that vegetation and erosion control as soon as you can. See if this guy works. This was before uh, restoration on the downstream end of the project. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll let that guy do the talking. So that was before restoration, and, and what you could see there is with a centrifugal acceleration, your thaw wag and the fastest moving water is going to just be right up against the edge of the bank, just banging away at that thing and scouring around the tow. And then with a bank like that, you have cantilever failure is essentially what you have. The toe of the bank is getting eroded away, and eventually the mass above that just collapses on top of the hole that's created down there at the toe. Uh, so that's the you know, reason we use these structures is to kind of move that high velocity water away from the edge of the stream bank. So this is the same location, we come back, we've you know, laid the stream bank back a little bit, created the bank full bench, and then installed structures. We got one there, one there, and you can see looking at the water, you know, how calm that water is relative to what it was when we we're looking at that vertical cut bank. And so that's what these structures, you know, why we put them in there. Uh, they just help move that water uh, away from the edge of the stream bank and keep it from eroding all the, you know, the work that you put in doing that restoration. Now this, this discharge here is just thankful discharge. This is that storm that happened just like a few days after we did the construction. So, you know, it, it's pretty rugged right now, but you can imagine what it is when it's four times this discharge, you know, how much water and how much stream power you've got working through the site at that point. Uh, this is the site, uh, same place, same day, just after sun came out, thunderstorm went away. Uh, you can see it's all in good shape. And even, you know, here where we've got our little bankful bench, as small as it is, that bench is only two foot wide, but it gives a place for that water to spread out a little bit and, and dissipate some of the energy and reduce some of the shear uh, forces that are out there. Uh, on all these projects, we like to come back in and do some post-evaluation and you know, how successful is it in reducing stream bank erosion. Um, you know, I could do a whole another hour and a half, probably ready to go soon. 
Um, talking about the methodologies that we use to estimate stream bank erosion, we use a system called Bank Erosion Hazard Index combined with near bank shear stress. And it allows us to use uh, these charts that we've developed. You know, we take our bank erosion score, run it up to the line that approximates our near bank shear stress, run it across, and it'll give us a predicted number for stream bank erosion. Like I said, we talked a lot about that. Well, this is the nuts and bolts. I mean, this is what we want to see. You know, uh, before restoration, we were moving seven tenths of a foot per year. Come back after a year's worth of uh, monitoring and look at it, and you know, we've maintained our, our channel dimension there. I uh, talked about sediment and phosphorus load reductions. That's always, um, you know, it, those numbers are what help you get more funding for the future. I mean, it can look great. I can fish great, but the real money right now is coming from water quality improvements. So then you can start articulating how much phosphorus, how much sediment, and put a real number on it, and how that translates to water quality treatment costs. Uh, that, that helps you get uh, additional funding in the future. Real quick, Sweetbriar Park. Um, you guys saw this the other day. Uh, essentially what we did on this project, let me see if I can find us a good picture. Well, I'll go back one. It's just as good as any. Uh, this was about three years ago. And that check dam is right here. This is uh, ice storm debris from the uh, ice storm we had. Uh, and you can see it's starting to cut around the end of that check dam. City came in and did the requisite pull the lever, dump the rock. Hopefully that'll check the erosion. And it, in a matter of, a, I don't know, a few months, all that material's become urbanite. You know, it's... it's uh, Sacrificial time release, sacrificial riprap, yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we got out to the project site to do the actual work, you know, we had lost another 20 feet of stream bank before we got in there. Uh, this is one of the structures we used. And, you know, that's a constraint we had to deal with. We had a 36 inch high pressure water line. Um, you know, if one of those blows out while you're working on it, it'll probably lift the excavator up off the ground 15 feet and then end up quarter mile downstream before you know, the excavator stops moving. So that was kind of sketchy working around, you know, infrastructure like that in trying to do, you know, a natural channel design. Uh, the, you know, the biggest thing, biggest impact on the site was that check dam and the deposition it created. So these are all kind of before, you know, and so you guys went out there yesterday and looked at it and, and, and you know, saw what it looked like. You know, prior, prior to us doing any work, it was just one long continuous vertical cut bank around the entire park site. Um, this gives you an idea of the amount of erosion. This was over a one-year period. So this is where we were measuring from the first you know, initial measurement. That's the same place, but now you can see how far away from the stream bank uh, we were at that point. So you know, this is all parkland that's getting lost. So you know, from the park's perspective, it's not a very big park. It's a linear park. Uh, you know, they're losing you know, 1 20th of their park a year. It doesn't take long. You don't have a park anymore. Of course, then that's less maintenance, but then you don't have happy uh, neighbors. Um, so, you know, the idea was to come through and do this restoration. I'll give you an idea of what some of the flow looked like out there at the project site during the big flood in April. Now, this is before we had the, you know, it was like it rained Friday and Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday it just came and just, well, it closed campus and everything on Monday. So this is... This is on Sunday. This isn't even the big flow, but it'll give you an idea of, of what the water looks like out there. And, and to give you an idea, uh, after the water receded from this storm event, let me back up and hit it again. After the water receded from this storm event, the site was in, I would say, 98% stable condition. There weren't any problems uh, that we saw after we had the big flood. But the biggest thing that, you know, I notice when I look at this is as that water continues to go down around that bend, centrifugal acceleration is taking, taking hold, and it's just swinging that water further and further and further and further to the outside of that bend. And so the, the point of greatest impact is the, the area that you guys saw yesterday where that scour hole was at. Now, two things were happening at that scour hole. Now, one of the things that was happening um, was we had that check dam, a little part of it. Now, our original design was to come in and extract the check dam in a hole, just take the whole check dam out. We got in there and grabbed it with the, the excavator, and he pounded on a little bit, and you could see the water shaking about 30, 40 feet upstream. So in between that was that water line. We are like, no, that's not good. We're not, we're not going to be pounding on this thing to get it out. So we had to get out a hydraulic cutting saw, and we did uh, cuts on that check dam, little piano key cuts every foot or so, 
in the opening that we created. We ended up leaving part of it, which you saw exposed yesterday. Anytime you have anything run across the channel, we mentioned it earlier, cross-channel obstruction, any hydraulic uh, that you introduce is going to cause some problems. So if you imagine that thing just kind of sticking up, when that water hits it, it jumps up over it. When it go, what goes up must come down, and when that hydraulic jump comes down, it was just scouring out the material that was behind there. So that was the, you know, the overriding impact that we had from that water line. It's just this hydraulic jump that was uncontrolled. Uh, the plan for repairing that has come in there with stouter stuff. We're, uh, we'll, we'll line just that 20-foot section where the scour was uh, with, with a stacked rock wall on the basement. We're going to use larger rock. You know, what we lost was gravel. And that was the last place we did any work out there. Put gravel in there, planted it uh, back and then again. And the gravel just didn't stand a chance when, once that hydraulic wave was set up over top of that water line. So, uh, you know, this is this, that site before. Like I said, this is uh, three years ago. Uh, and this is after. And this is where that gravel was. You can see it. I mean, and that's what's gone. And so what we're going to do, I mean, the structure's still there. It's all tied in. This rock's still there. Uh, but this material here is gone. Um, you know, you just got to put a little bit more. And one of the things, we've always tried to be real sensitive. We want to be super green when we do these projects. But sometimes you've got to go a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right as far as your design approach, depending on your constraints. And so instead of being criticized for having too much rock or, you know, looking too hard, um, you know, the geomorphologists would come and say, oh, you got too much rock. It's, it doesn't look natural because you got so much rock. Well, you know, you got to kind of weigh the opinion versus the objective of, of the project. So uh, a little bit more rock in this case would have helped us out a lot. Uh, this is looking downstream. Again, you know, we had this just long vertical cut bank, um, and that's, you know, what it's looking like. Uh, that was a week ago, July, in July, so 